We're going to be in the uh, Gospel of Matthew in chapter 7 this morning. And let me just say thank you so much for the opportunity. And I am so honored and so humbled every time I have the chance to open this book. Because when we open this book, we hear from God. So why don't we begin in Matthew chapter 7, and then let me uh, read the passage, chapter 7, verses 1 to 5, and we'll pray briefly. Chapter 7, verse 1. Judge not that you not be judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye? But you do not notice the log that's in your own eye. Or how can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye? When there is a log in your own. You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take that speck out of your brother's eye. Let's pray. Father, in the eyes of the world, what we're about to do is a foolish thing. We are going to look at a book that we claim comes from God, but we know it to be the truth, for it's been revealed to us, and your spirit bears witness to the truth. And so, God, would you come and make what seems foolish to be full of the Spirit, to build us up in wisdom and to tear us down in humility that we might see Christ more clearly in our lives. We love you and we desperately need you for these precious few minutes we have with your word. Would you come now? In Jesus' name, amen. Today's text comes from the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, It's a famous passage in many ways, even outside the church. Uh, If you say anything critical in our culture of an individual, many times someone will correct you and quickly say, ah, judge not lest you be judged in the old King James. I can remember working with a coworker. I, I, I was making some evaluations of a certain political candidate, and she quickly commented that I should not be judging other people. Is that really what this text means, though? That's the question before us as we begin. Today's text, as I said, comes from the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus is recorded, or what's recorded for us are Jesus' words to his disciples as he teaches them what it's like or what it would look like to live out a Christian life in the kingdom of God. And so today's teachings from Christ are for us in the church, not necessarily for the world, but those who call ourselves Christians. And the great question behind the Sermon on the Mount is, how are those who claim the name of Christian supposed to live? And so that's where we find ourselves. Chapter 7, Jesus is beginning to deal with interpersonal temptations, things that arise as we rub up against one another. In chapter 5 and 6, he's dealt with the issues of the heart, and the inner, internal uh, sins we deal with. And now he's addressing what happens when we rub up against one another in the kingdom of God. And as I said, today's verse is well known, as many will quip, judge not, as we share a critical word about someone else. However, this pa- in this passage, I submit to you that Jesus is not telling Christians that we are simply uh, to, to look past all the wrongs of those around us. That's what many people think this passage means. But instead, what we're going to see is that Jesus Christ, instead of telling us to forgo all judgment, is telling us how we ought to properly judge, and that it begins with ourselves first. Jesus does this several times, telling us how to properly judge. Even right here in chapter 7 and verse 16, Jesus tells us we ought to beware of false prophets. He's not saying you should look past their faults and just pass no judgment on them. In fact, he's telling us that we will know false prophets by the fruit of their life, and we're to look at how they live in order to discern whether they're truly from God or not, for we will know them by their fruit. So if Jesus is not telling us to simply forego all judgment, we have to ask, what is Jesus meaning when he tells us in this passage to judge not? Well, I think the problem that Jesus is addressing, as I said, is an interpersonal problem that happens when we rub up against one another in the church, is the problem that uh, we tend to judge other people's sins more harshly than our own. We tend to maximize the sins of others and minimize, neglect, or overlook our own. So, 
If that's true of us, Jesus is saying, we are in fact, when we do this, maximizing the sins of others while minimizing our own sins or even neglecting to mention them, we are in fact acting in an unchristian manner. And how the church would be changed if we would just heed the message of these few verses to consider first our own sins before we consider the sins of others. So how are we to overcome this problem we seem to run into all the time where we so clearly see the sins of other people and yet neglect to see our own? Well, it begins with the judgment of God. Not a popular phrase or term in today's culture, but one that the church ought to look at regularly and understand because it's at the core of the gospel, the fact that God is judge. God's judgment is the antidote to a judgmental attitude. That's what we see in the first four verses of chapter 7, where Jesus is telling us, judge not, or we will be judged. The thing that we forget, as I said in judging others, is that we ourselves will soon be judged. One day, perhaps tomorrow, next week, or in a few years, we will stand before the judge himself and give an account for our life. Jesus says, you will be judged. So what's particularly scary is that we will be judged by God. Because really, it's a small thing to be judged by men. We feel as though uh, if you struggle with people pleasing like I do, that to be judged by men is a weighty thing, but I, ch- I trust the scriptures and I believe them, and I believe it's a far weightier, a far more troubling thing to be judged by an almighty and holy God. Jesus says, You will be judged. It's right there in verse 2. There could be some sense of judgment from other people as we share critical things, but I can't help but think that Jesus has an eternal perspective in mind when he says we will be judged. And the thing that a judgmental person does in judging everyone else, the thing that I do myself and we often fall victim of, is that we, uh, we see other people's sins and we forget we ourselves are sinners and will one day be judged. God will not only judge the sins that we so readily see, But as chapter 5 and 6 tells us, God will judge all of the sins we don't see. Every inclination of the heart, God looks upon and will call to account. Now the thing about God's judgment in the gospel is that the judgment is applied differently to those outside of Christ than it is those inside of Christ. So how is the judgment of God supposed to help those outside of Christ overcome this attitude? Well, We often, and those outside the church, do the very same thing that we do. We put others on a balance scale in our own mind, and we weigh them, and we weigh their actions, and we consider, uh, and we often criticize those actions. We put other people's sins on a scale and forget we ourselves will one day ourselves be put on an entirely different scale. And what then? What will we say when Jesus confronts us over our life? When Jesus calls us to account for how we spent our time, money, and our heart on the things of this world. Well, I want to address those who might call themselves Christians. You use Christian rules and principles to live your life, but I don't want to assume that everybody in this room actually has a personal saving faith in Jesus Christ. I don't want to run right over the gospel. I want to make sure that everyone here knows that one day they'll face Jesus Christ. And if you do not have faith in him, what will you give an account to? You will give an account in one of two ways. You will either point to your own good behavior, actions, and deeds of your life, and try to uh, justify yourself before God by those, or you will say, I have no righteousness of my own. Even the good things I have done are tarnished by the bad that I do. And so I have only hope in Jesus Christ and his righteousness and his hanging on the cross for me in order to pass the judgment. What will we say when we die and face Jesus Christ, the judge? You only have two answers. Yourself or someone else will stand in your place. Jesus says, for the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. See, you want God to deal with you in a merciful and compromising way. Do you not? You want God to look on you with grace and mercy, and yet we're so quick to look on others without mercy or grace. 
We look on the sins of others without regard for our own sins before God. But friends, there is only one person in the history of the world who can look on the sins of others with no regard for his own sin, and it's Jesus Christ because he has never sinned. So before we are too quick to pass over, I want to ask you, those who would say you're Christian, will you point to your church attendance or the way you voted or the things that you stood for in this life? To justify yourself before the judge? Or will you humbly acknowledge that you need mercy and grace from God that only comes from Jesus Christ? Those are the only two answers that you'll have to give on that day. So that's judgment of those outside of Christ. Now what of those who, who are Christians? Those of us who do humbly accept the grace offered to us in Jesus Christ and are growing in grace and mercy daily. How does this passage help us? As Christians, well, as Christians, we still must heed the judgment of God because it's the judgment of God at the very center of the gospel that makes us in need of Christ's mercy and forgiveness. See, the answer is, for us Christians, that God's judgment humbles those in Christ so that we are then able to see and assist others in overcoming their sins and that they may in turn see our sins rightly and help us in overcoming them. Jesus says in verse 5, You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. You see, it's an order of operations. It's not that we're supposed to look past everyone else's sins. It's that we're first and foremost supposed to consider our own before God that humbles us so that we may then have taking the log out of our own eye see to assist our brother with the speck that's in his own eye. This, in many ways, uh, depicts my relationship with Craig on Wednesdays. We humble ourselves in prayer and by God's grace try to take the giant timber out of our own eye that we might assist the other on the other side of the call with the speck that's in their own. As Christians who believe the gospel, we keep the judgment of God in mind when we look on our brothers, sisters, neighbors, and friends who call on Christ. Because this humbles us and helps us to use a proper gospel judgment. We will see ourselves on the scales of judgment and spared before we consider the judgment and sins of others. You will know yourself to be a sinner before addressing someone else as one. We keep the judgment of God in mind when we look upon others because we know we will be judged and we will only be spared, not by our own good deeds and righteousness, as I've said, but by the blood of another, Jesus Christ. See, the antidote to a judgmental and critical attitude is the judgment of God. Your sins, which he has set aside in Christ. That's the gospel. And that's how it helps us overcome a judgmental attitude towards others. Because we're humbled and we come under the same standard of judgment that we see others under as well. And it allows us to see, uh, to see that they are as much in need of the mercy of God as we are. It doesn't matter how big of a sinner they are. They are in need of God's mercy as much as I am. Because that need was that Jesus Christ would die. For you, for me, and the brother or sister across the table from you. So by way of application, let me ask you to consider how much time do you spend considering in your own heart and mind the actions of others versus your own actions before God? How often, how much time do you spend writing critical commentary online or being quick to correct your child for their sin, which they probably learned from you in some measure, I have four of them. Before we consider, do we consider our own before the sins of others? I want to just ask you to examine your heart before God. Jesus is saying that we are to first examine ourselves and our own sins, take the log out of our own eye, and if we do this, we will help others by seeing the gospel clearly. So do you live an active Christian life? Are you daily considering yourself before God and thanking him for his mercy, asking him for the forgiveness of your sins as you spoke that way to your wife or you said that critical thing about your neighbor to your spouse? Do you spend as much time tearing up over your own sins as you do tearing down other opponents politically? 
That's what Jesus is saying. Have you considered yourself before God before you consider the sins of others? Be first concerned with your own sins, Jesus is saying. Believe the gospel has the power to cleanse you and change you where you fall short, and then the order of operations, and then you'll be in a position to help others address their sins and believe that Christ has the power to change them because you've seen him change you. (laughs) You've seen him soften your heart in a way that if he hadn't, you don't know where you'd be today. We must first be concerned with the sins of our own life before those of others. The point of the analogy of the log and the speck is this. The sins of others should always be disproportionately small to us in comparison to our own sin. Think of the Apostle Paul. He wrote to Timothy, a young pastor, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, and he calls himself the chief of all sinners, the supreme czar of sin. He sees himself before God before seeing the sins of others. That's the point, and I think that's what Jesus Christ is asking us to do. If you spend, do you spend much more time upset about how others are acting around you, in your family, your neighborhood, or society, than you do upset over your own stumbling? Because if you do, look at verse 5. You hypocrite are the words from our Lord Jesus. You hypocrite. Because it's not acting according to the gospel to do so. You must first and foremost be concerned to seek God's help in removing the log from your eye and the sin in your own heart before you address the speck in a brother's eye. And friends, the degree to which you see yourself in need of grace is the degree to which you will judge rightly the sins of others. If you see, listen to this, if you see yourself in need of little mercy before God, you will have little mercy in judging others. You may know people like this. It's very hard to be around them because everything is critical. And you wonder if they think themselves to be perfect. It seems so obvious to you, but then Jesus says, whoa, (laughs) consider your sins first before theirs. If you see yourself in need of little mercy before God, you will have little mercy in judging others. I sat across from a friend a couple months ago who described to me the way in which his marriage was falling apart because of his anger. And he was telling me how his anger was alienating his spouse. She was getting more and more removed from him and uh, frankly scared of him in his anger. And uh, his children, who are probably about two and four years old, have now become scared of him. And so I asked him to describe for me a situation. Tell me a particular time where this happened in your marriage or in your house. And he began to describe to me this scenario where they had gone as a family to a, to a thrift store that gives out things for free to seminary students. And so he went and received this item completely free of charge for his home. It was a home item, a storage bin of some kind. He brought it home, and his wife set it outside the house, and it stayed there for several days, and uh, the judgment in his mind began to go, well, it's been there one day. I'm not saying anything. It's been there two days. I swear, I'm not going to say anything, because it's going to get broken, but it's, I'm not going to say anything. Day three, and sure enough, it got knocked over and was broken, this free item, which he did not pay for, and was a gift to him. And he immediately turned in rage on his wife for how foolish she had been in uh, allowing this item to go into neglect and get broken. I would just remind you in this story that he had received this plastic storage container for his house completely free. He uh, had—his wife had set it outside and it was broken. And he was more concerned— about the second-hand storage bin he had received for free than he was in how he judged and reacted and responded to his wife. He looked at me with tears in his eyes as I took him to Matthew 18, and I said to him, I took him to the this, this story, if you want to turn there, we won't read it, but uh, the parable of the unforgiving or merciful servant. I took him there because it was clear to me he had a very acute view of his wife's sin, but saw himself in little or no need of mercy before God. And the story in Matthew 18 is this. 
Jesus tells a parable. Peter asks, how many times must I forgive my brother? Is it just three times as tradition taught, or seven times, which is a perfect number? I'm really going out of my way, Peter says, by forgiving him seven, and Jesus says, no, 70 times seven. And he tells him this story. A servant goes into the king. The king calls to account all of his debts. He owes him billions of dollars. And the king says, sell him and his family to pay me at least something on his debts. He pleads with him, please forgive me my debt. Please let me go, and I will repay you everything I owe. The king, being gracious and merciful, says, forgiven. All your debt is cleared. And no sooner has he stepped outside of the throne room does he meet one of his fellow servants. And his fellow servant owes him about a couple months' wages. And that fellow servant uh, is then immediately accosted by him. He You can just envision him putting his hands around his neck and demanding his money. He says, please let me go and I'll work and repay you. And he says, absolutely not. And he sends him to jail, completely unforgiving and unmerciful, until everything should be paid. Well, the other servants hear this. They tell the king. The king calls him in and calls him to account. And he says, how could you have been so unforgiving when I forgave you so much? My friend in this story that I'm sharing had forgotten how much he had been forgiven as he looked upon his wife in what was just simply a foolish mistake, a small infraction, a 10-pound infraction which received a 50-pound return. And he had forgotten that he was himself in need of great mercy before God as he looked on his wife. He had more concern, as I said, for this second-hand item than he did for his wife. And I took him to Matthew 18 simply so that he would understand this, the degree to which we see ourselves in need of mercy is the degree to which we will have mercy in others as we judge their sins, knowing that God is the ultimate judge and not me. How our churches would change and how our society would look different if we simply had the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ before us as we spoke to our friends, our family, our children about sin in their life. Craig tells me great things about this church, and I pray it would continue to be so, that you would be filled with grace and mercy as you deal with one another as you rub up against each other in this kingdom of God, this outpost for the king, I pray that you would have the mercy of Jesus Christ in your heart and that you would then help your brother see the speck in his eye. Let's pray. Father, I tremble to even share this word with them because I know I myself have a giant log sticking in my eye. For I am often short of mercy for my children, for my neighbors, for my wife. And you have so richly blessed me with the death of your son. God, I pray that as Christians we would turn from our judgmentalness and that we would see we too have been judged but set aside in Christ, that we have not received the wrath we deserve and we would not turn on our loved ones in wrath. Come with us now and be with us as we close this service. Fill us with your spirit and as we go into this week, help us to live these truths in our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.